All right, well, welcome everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Chris Carberry. I'm CEO of Explore Mars, and so certainly I'm glad to see you here today to talk about the important uh, topic of Mars exploration and harnessing the mandate for Mars and how we can actually get to Mars by the early 2030s and make sure that policy remains focused on that goal. Understanding there are a number of, yes, we want to do a number of intermediate goals in between, but we have a great panel to talk about that. But before I get to the panelists, I first off want to uh, thank our sponsor today, which is Boeing. So thank you very much, Boeing, for uh, making this uh, panel possible. I also want to mention that uh, a number of us just came from a workshop, our fifth annual uh, Mars Achievability and Sustainability Workshop, which we've done, obviously, for five years, which brings together stakeholders, mission architects, scientists, uh, folks from NASA, industry, academia, and some international participants try to build momentum, build agreements, synergies, to find ways to move forward on um, space, uh, Mars exploration. Within your folders here, you will have, you'll find a um, summary of the one we did last year, which we call AM4, as well as some other documents. Um, but this year, we are focusing primarily on uh, mission architecture, bringing all the key mission architecture experts around the country together to see if we can find more of a community-wide community agreement see where all the synergies lie, the commonalities, and the departures, and how uh, different companies, as well as NASA and others, are approaching the concept of the approach of getting to Mars. So we've been spending a lot of time this week on this topic. We hope to be able to have a report out on that uh, probably by early, probably the end of January. We hope to be able to have that report, which we will share with Congress. We always try to get a copy of that to every member of Congress when we have that released. And in our first speaker today, Joe Cassidy, will actually be giving a brief summary of that um, workshop. I should also know we also did another workshop at the same time called the VR and AR and Space uh, Workshop, basically looking how virtual reality and augmented reality can be utilized for future space exploration and mission operations, science, and um, public engagement. So that was a really interesting <coughs> one, and we we're trying to see how we can also work that into the whole engine. Um, architecture process as well. So um, before we start, I just want to give a few highlights. We, uh, we'll go into more detail with the panel. You know, as I mentioned before, we truly believe there is a mandate for Mars. Obviously, early this year, you know, the, Na the NASA Transition Authorization Act uh, was signed. It has, certainly has the most comprehensive language ever produced for a piece of U.S. legislation in advocating Mars. But we've seen that there is strong public support, bipartisan support, recent polling, including our own 2013 Mars Generation um, scientific poll showed over 70% support. Another poll that we released but we didn't produce uh, that was released last year showed well over 60% approval from the US, from U.S. citizens. So we can see, show there's clear support for this uh, goal and clear economic goals as well. Within many meetings recently, we've been told to try to highlight some of the economic factors, and we will be over the next few months also be producing a short report on uh, the economic impact of uh, Mars exploration and space exploration in general. To highlight some of the small businesses and other um, companies around, yeah, around the country that play a role in this, companies that you wouldn't necessarily look to. We all know about the Boeings, the Aerojets, Lockheed, etc. But there are a lot of um, small companies around the, um, the nation that are doing important work that most people don't know about. Just a few small examples. You know, we were just looking at the list today, and for instance, major tool in Indianapolis, you know, who um, produced large parts for the SLS, including the RS-25 engine, as, as well as the RS-68 for the Delta IV L, uh, LV for security missions. And they do important work, but even Joe, who grew up in Indianapolis, wasn't aware yet they were working on this, even though they were connected with his own company. So, you know, it's Futurama, Futuramic, which is in Warren, Michigan, which used to be a um, auto, auto manufacturer, did auto parts, but fell into hard times, was able to reinvent itself as now creating, building aerospace parts and playing a key role with Orion. And companies like Honeybee in New York City, I believe in Hell's Kitchen, Manhattan, you know, not usually the place you look for a company manufacturing key components for space exploration, 
have done for, I think most of the blenders we've had have produced like curiosity and spirit and opportunity, drilling apparatus, abrasion devices, and most people, once again, companies around that you don't usually look to, but are there. And so we're gonna to try to work on that to highlight the broader impact and how it affects many more people around the country than at least most people are aware of. So, um, anyway, right before I um, introduce the um, panel, I also want to start off with, as I mentioned earlier, we believe we have a mandate. We have a lot of great mission architecture <coughs> concepts. We're going to try to come up with, with the process of the 40 Mars workshop uh, with a more unified approach. But we think the key, key issue right now is we need a decision. And this is really where the problem lies. We keep, we're never able to make a decision on this. So we're hoping between Congress, the administration, and everybody else, we can finally pick a pathway forward. So at any rate, uh, our panel today, I'm going to start all the way at the end and move forward. Uh, yeah, many of you know, of course, <laughs> Jeff Bingham, former senior Senate staffer. But Je Jeff hasn't been um, <laughs> let retirement keep him um, not busy. He's a member of the Space Studies Board. You know, he's a member of vice chairman of the Virginia Commercial Space Flight Authority. He's also on the board of advisors for Explore Mars. So <laughs> thank you, Jeff. Uh, our, our next speaker is Janet Ivey, who many of you were, um, recognize from Janet's Planet, you know, television series. Plus, she goes all around the country giving these dynamic talks to students. You know, I think you, you speak to thousands of students at a time, don't you? In many places around the country, you know, in the mid places which don't normally have a lot of space exploration, uh, you know, uh, contact. So, and many of the places she's speaking have no connection to NASA whatsoever, but thousands of students appear uh, to hear her space talks. Then, many of you will also recognize Alan Stofan, former uh, chief scientist of NASA. So, we're happy to have her along to talk about the current state of science and what we should expect, particularly if we want to get to Mars by the 2030s. And lastly, but not least, Joe Cassidy, Executive Director for Space in the DC office of Aerojet Rocketdyne. And so, Joe, we're going to start with Joe, who's going to give an overview of our 40 Mars workshop, as well as some of the architectural concepts we've been talking about. So, Joe and um, Vera, if you could bring that up, please. So, as Chris said, um, we just did this workshop um, on Mars achievability. Um, it's our fifth one. We've evolved over five years from uh, can we even think about going to Mars in the 2030s to now the how, um, what are the pieces. Um, and that's why um, I wanted to be here today. Actually, we had a, a I'm actually a poor substitute for a really good young professor from Purdue, Sarag Turkia, who was going to be here and had a family emergency and couldn't come. Um, but there's a lot of exciting work going on in architectures looking at going to Mars. Um, it's not just our company, um, as I said, Purdue, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Orville ATK, um, and then the new entrants like SpaceX. Everyone's excited about this idea and thinking about how to go and do this. So I just put this chart up to sort of give you a notional overview, and I'm going to talk about a couple of the pieces. What's that? Just pointing to the side. Oh, so yeah, sure sorry. Yeah. yeah. And behind you. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I'm looking at it on the wall behind you. Um, but what you see on this chart, it's kind of a good way to kind of, it's a framework. It's just a, a couple of concepts there. Yeah, I'm sure you're all aware we're building the SLS now. Chris mentioned some of the suppliers that are working on hardware. And that's a really exciting thing as you go around the country now. And we have had a lot of events this year um, where we go out to those suppliers and you see the pride that these people take in cutting metal again to build these uh, major, major elements that we're gonna need to do this journey. Um, and it's everywhere, it's all across the country. So SLS is well underway. Um, we've got the RS-25 engines for EM-1, the first launch of SLS are all completely tested now. They're sitting waiting um, to be integrated into the rocket. Um, next year, we're going to do a full stage test, first time since the Apollo program. We've, we've actually put four engines under a stage and fired them up like that. I highly recommend it if you can get down to Mississippi and see that test. It'll be the most awesome, loud thing you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> um, we, uh, 
We are working on Orion as well. Uh, as many of you know, we've already flown Orion. We had the EFT-1 test uh, just uh, three years ago yesterday it was launched. Um, a very successful test. A lot of the pieces uh, are now you know, well understood uh, in terms of the re-entry technology that we're using there. Um, new pieces are coming along. The one thing about the SLS, uh, even compared to like the space shuttle, it's going to be very safe and we're going to test the uh, abort and escape system, uh, the launch abort system, again in a, another test where we actually take it up to altitude and fire it. It's been tested once before from, from the surface, but there'll be another test, the AA2 test that's coming up in about a year. Um, but these are the first pieces, and as you go down that, that uh, left-hand side of the chart, you can see the other pieces. And I just want to talk about a couple of those today and talk about our meeting. Um, we looked at, for instance, the Deep Space Gateway. It's something that NASA's begun to really start to focus on now. Um, it's by the moon. It's out there. The moon is, is a really nice place for us to go and test a lot of this stuff out. And we can build the kinds of systems that we're going to need to transfer crew and also begin to look at some of the propulsion technologies we're going to need to transfer cargo. And um, those are both things that we can do out there at that deep space gateway. And obviously, um, we'll use SLS and Orion to go and visit, to take crew out there. The crew can stay for progressively longer times. And I think that's one part that I really wanted to mention. An aspect of this that sometimes is lost is, as Chris said, we can talk about plans, we can draw up the things, we can you know, evolve them um, and test them in certain ways on, on Earth. But the real things, uh, the real learning gets done when we fly. And the fact that we can put something out there, go to it, keep it out there for a long period of time, the systems will be operating even when the crew's not there, we're going to learn a lot when we do that and we can evolve that before we get ready to leave for Mars in the late 2020s. And then the rest of the diagram you can see we've got other elements that are going to need to be developed to transport. In our, in our architecture at Aerojet Rocketdyne, we have cargo going with a deep space transport vehicle that uses solar electric propulsion, um, and the crew goes on a much faster route using either chemical, cryogenic chemical propulsion or nuclear thermal propulsion. And then we have pieces like the Mars uh, lander and habitat and the Mars ascent vehicle that are also coming along. So a number of exciting developments were moving along this path and you can see the timeline at the bottom that, that we can take this milestone by milestone step toward human missions in the 2030s. So I'm excited to say that we're on that path, we're making good progress. In a meeting we just did, we actually took all of us that have been working on these architectures put us in a room for two and a half days and we were challenged by the organizers to look at three very different kinds of approaches ranging from let's just do an Apollo style sortie mission to Mars, get there, touch the surface and come back. What would it take to do that? That's on one extreme, very scaled down and on the opposite extreme, let's colonize Mars. So. And, and those results are going to be written up and we'll have a report coming out. In the middle we have what I would call an Antarctic style outpost that, that we would continually support over multiple missions. Uh, so look forward to uh, sharing that report with you and I think that's all I have for you today. Thanks. All right, great John. Alan, um, and we'll wait for your slides to come up. And we apologize, they're only on the sides here. <laughs> So when my slides come up, I'm going to give you, hopefully, uh, step back a second and remind everybody of, of why Mars. Um, you know, I, I love to use this image of Gale Crater from Curiosity because it really, to me, if I told you this was somewhere in the Middle East or if I told you this was in the deserts of Utah, you would be hard pressed to, to prove me wrong. And I've done a fair amount of field work out in Utah. And these are my kind of rocks. You know, they're, they're, you know, only a geologist could love them. They're layered sandstones and shales. And so what that's telling us is this history of a wet Mars. And so all of our spacecraft have really been coming together. Uh, and again, for a geologist, we look at each of those layers of rocks because the chemistry of each layer tells you something about the history uh, of that planet. And that's why Mars is so unique. It's a sedimentary rock planet um, like the Earth. 
Um, I think we're going to have to hit play on this if we could. Um, no, can I go back? I go to the next one. It's just supposed to play automatically. I don't know why it's not. Next slide? Yeah, it's supposed to play. It's a movie. No, okay. So, <laughs> so much for technology. Um, so when you think of all the spacecraft, that robotic spacecraft that NASA has sent to Mars over the last 30 or so years, uh, from the original looks that we got at Mars, to the Viking spacecraft, uh, to the Phoenix lander, the, the various rovers we've sent, all the orbiters we've sent. And for a lot of people, I think they really struggle, why has NASA sent so many missions there? What we have done, and with our international partners, sorry, with Mars Express and the Indian Mars mission, uh, and coming up soon with the United Arab Emirates Mars mission, it's not going to play. Okay, I don't know why. Okay. Um, it's all right. What those have been able to tell us and what we've really been pursuing um, is what I was talking about a second ago with that image from Curiosity. <coughs> trying to build up what is the history of Mars, starting from 4.6 billion years ago when Mars formed up to the present day. How can we use the chemistry of the rocks? How can we look at how they're layered? How can we look at the detailed geology to get this history of Mars? And so what we have figured out is to me just incredibly exciting. We've obviously long known that there was water on the surface of Mars from those very early images of Mars where we could see what appeared to be canals or rivers cutting across the surface. But what we've been able to narrow down with all of these missions we've done is that somewhere from about 4.0, 4 billion years ago to about 3.5, 3.6, 3.7 billion years ago, there was water on the surface of Mars in this video is supposed to show you Mars rotating and then turning into this blue planet um, like Earth. Uh, and, and so this idea that Mars, at the time, at the time that uh, life evolved here on Earth, the conditions on Mars were not that different. Mars was a wet planet, it was a blue planet. Uh, we know that, that the building blocks of life, uh, things like amino acids are present in, in comets, they're present in asteroids, so those same building blocks of life uh, that helped life to originate here on this planet, those same conditions persisted on the surface of Mars. So you say, okay, if you had two air places with such similar conditions, should life have also evolved on Mars? So this is the excitement. To me, this is the driver. We have within our reach the ability to really determine, did life evolve on another planet? The place to go is clearly Mars. So what we are able to do with the various <laughs> instruments we have is really narrow down. Where do we go look? So what we've been trying to do with our, our instruments is say, what, where do the rocks tell us were the wet places? Where were not only the wet places, say 3.8, 3.9 billion years ago on Mars, um, where are those rocks exposed near the surface? Where are the very specific chemistry of those types of rocks telling us that that was a particular environment, for example, a hot spring environment, that would be an environment that would be conducive to the evolution of life? And we're now able to really pinpoint, and as you can see from all the dots on this, on this image, our instruments have really been giving us an embarrassment of, of riches in terms of potential landing sites for humans to go explore for future robotic missions to explore. Now, a, a lot of people, I would say, you know, years ago, there was always, why, why humans, why don't we just send robots? And, and I would, you know, I'm a field geologist, so I go out in the field and study volcanoes. You know, humans are creative, we're fast, we move fast, we're, we're, you can, we can change on the, the drop of a hat, we can read a landscape. And frankly, when you're looking for fossilized evidence of life, um, you're going to have to break open a lot of rocks and do a lot of looking, and a human is the ideal uh, thing to go do that. Now, when we think about how are we actually going to look for life on Mars, I'm sorry, this slide got a little screwed up, um, the scientific community has really been struggling with the very question of, are we going to recognize life on another planet when we see it? What if life on another planet is very different from life here on Earth? And so we've really been starting from first principles. What are the general indicators of life? That's a lot of what we've been doing on Mars so far, starting in the, in the lower left. Was it a wet environment? Was it not too acidic? Was it not too basic? Was there a source of energy like a hot spring that life could use that energy to evolve? 
Um, and so we're already there with Mars. We're now at the next step on Mars looking for potential biomolecule components. That's part of what the, the Curiosity rover has been. Now what that means is we're looking for things potentially like amino acids, things that are organic molecules that are potentially related to life. So far, Curiosity has found organic molecules, but they've been fragments. They haven't, and that's not surprising. The surface of Mars is radiated. Radiation breaks up organic molecules. So that's what we've been finding so far, but Curiosity is certainly going to keep looking. Obviously, ideally, you want to find things like functional molecules. That's something like DNA, RNA. Then if you're really hoping for living life, you're going to look for signs of metabolism, for growth and reproduction for Darwinian evolution. So the scientific community has really been struggling with what do we measure, what instruments do we send, and they've been making a huge amount of progress. Now the next mission to Mars will be the 2020 rover. Uh, this is a, a reflight, in a way, of, of the Curiosity rover with a whole new set of instruments, all of them designed to go into a potentially habitable environment and look for these environmental indicators that would be consistent with past life on Mars. It has an international component of instruments. It has a test of a future in-situ resource utilization experiment where we're going to be removing oxygen from the Mars atmosphere. This is um, in uh, preparation for eventually trying to synthesize rocket fuel on the surface of Mars. It's the first ISRU experiment we will do on Mars. Uh, the other really exciting thing about the Mars 2020 rover is that it's actually going to cache some samples, put some samples of rock in little tubes, and leave them on the Martian surface, potentially for a future mission later in the 2020s to pick up. Now, after 2020, there's just at this point notional conversations of what could come next. We know that eventually we're going to need another Mars orbiter. All the orbiters we have uh, right now uh, at Mars are getting older. They serve as communication relays to the, to the assets on the surface. Eventually, we're going to need uh, a new communications orbiter. Obviously, that's uh, an opportunity to put high-resolution cameras, maybe some more remote instruments. But really, we really need a comm orbiter at Mars. To me, that's also an exciting area for pu potentially public-private partnerships. A round trip to Mars, I think, is really critical. I just mentioned the 20-point <coughs> rover caching samples on the surface. Uh, in about 2003, I think it was, the National Academy did a study that said before we send humans to Mars, we should bring a sample back to the Earth. There's certainly scientific reasons we'd like to bring a sample back. Um, I, I think that issue actually could be revisited by the, and the Academy now that we've had um, from the Curiosity rover so many more really great measurements of the chemistry of the surface of Mars. Do we still really need to bring a rock back? Uh, before we go to Mars, I think that's something that we need to continue to push on. What I think is actually the huge driver for that mission is the Curiosity rover weighed about one metric ton. For humans, we're going to need somewhere on the order of 10, 20, 30 metric tons landed at a time. A sample return mission would be a really good exercise of landing somewhere, say, in the vicinity between 5 and 10 metric tons on the surface. It would be a good sort of pushing us to that next level for human exploration uh, of getting the mass that we can land and then launch off the surface of Mars. I think it's a really important sort of technology test bed uh, for that for future human uh, Mars mission. But once again, through the 2020s, you see human missions, you see robotic missions doing not just science, but helping to prepare for the eventual landing of humans on Mars. Uh, in the 2030s. And if anybody wants to talk about special regions and what uh, humans could do in Mars orbit before they land on Mars, uh, I'd be happy to talk about that uh, in the questions. <laughs> but I hope I've given you a little bit of the excitement of, of the fact that we are so close to being on the verge, I think, of not just finding evidence that life evolved on another planet, being able to study the diversity of that life, understand its implications for life here on Earth. Um, and, and Janet's going to be talking about, to me, this image. Uh, because underneath it all, I think, is the fundamental point that Mars inspires. This is Earthrise uh, from the Curiosity rover. And the person alive, who I hope is a girl, is going to actually be standing on the surface of Mars Seeing this, she is already born. 
she is alive right now. The girl who's going to be able to see this from the surface of Mars. So Mars, just like people like Buzz, inspired me to explore and move forward. That girl is going to be the next uh, inspirer of the next generation of explorers. Thank you. And uh, thank you for kind of uh, batting that whole thing up there. I do travel all over the country, and uh, I want you guys today to think about Mars as aspiration, inspiration, and destination. And uh, why send humans to Mars? Because Gene Roddenberry said we are on a journey to keep an appointment with whatever we are. And I can't think of a better STEM or STEAM tool than Mars. <coughs> And I'll tell you why, because it is an invitation. It's like, hey there, come here. There are questions to be discovered. There are mysteries to be unlocked. And uh, I believe we must give our students the universe and alight their imaginations. And we, we must empower them with the STEM skills so they can launch their lives. And kids are natural born explorers and it doesn't get any better than exploration to drive that point home. And when we address these issues of going to Mars, here's what we get, we get workforce. In 2018, there will be 2.3 million STEM jobs that the US does not have the talent to fill. Where are we gonna get that? We're gonna have to start building with some great organic material and it's not aluminum, iron, or titanium. <laughs> it is the organic raw material of young minds. And those young minds are in third grade. And I will tell you when I encounter them, you guys should invite third graders to every meeting you have because they will keep you honest and they will blow you away with their ideas. I do a lot of hands-on science. It's one of my best, most fun things. It, in fact, if anybody wants to try out my Martian hovercraft and know how these things work, I'll tell you after I'm done. Look at that cute face right there. How can you resist the kid in a Star Wars war shirt? But <clears throat> I want to show you this, this next slide. So we're going to try a little hack here. I'm going to play the audio from my computer. <laughs> The flyer, I like it. to hear, but the truth behind the universe, and I'll point out, it's a wheat thins box and a coffee filter. And so that's all you have to do. You have to give them the opportunity. And for me, it's all about giving kids permission to dream. I played astronaut on the playground. And so I think we need to give them also a purpose. Tony Wagner of Harvard, who wrote Making, um, uh, it's like, uh, let me tell you this, the the book is called In Creating Innovators, The Making of Young People Who Will Change the World. He says that we need to let our children play. And in the middle of their play, they may find their passion. And in the middle of their passion, they may very well find their purpose. Isn't it time we give our students and this country time to dream and have a purpose? It's like, what if we walked into class every day and it's like, okay, class, the world is in desperate need of your genius. We have got to get to Mars and the world is waiting on us to do this, so it's urgent. Let's begin. What would we come up with? I'll tell you what, we would solve a ton of problems. We'd probably solve our water shortages. We could come up with alternative fuel sources. We'd get rid of food scarcity. And again, this is so, it's, I'm so impassioned about it because it doesn't matter whether I am in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, or Dubuque, Iowa, Greenwood, Arkansas, New Albany, Indiana, Ocean City, New Jersey, or Newberry, South Carolina. These kids want to see humans go to Mars. If I ask them who wants to go to space, most of the hands go up. 
Occasionally a few of them think it's too far away from mom and dad and they would just rather sit here and control the computers that let everybody else go, but everybody gets a job is what I say. But again, guys, all we have to do is invite. Half the time I am using popsicle sticks and paper plates when we are just teaching these very simple mechanics of science. I am looking for whatever entry point I can find to get that girl who is going to be that person who walks on Mars. So the next time that you're with your children or your nieces and nephews or any kid around you, remind them that the world is in desperate need of their genius. Now, again, who knows, but one of these may be the next astrophysicist or the next person to design how we're going to get there. And all you have to do is open the door and tell them, all right, guys, here's what we need to do. We've got to think about habitat, where we're going to live, how we're going to live, how we're going to get you know, food. And they will stun you with what they will draw on a piece of paper and how in-depth they will get. I mean, if, if you could really embrace Joseph there, I mean, he had thought about those instruments and he had heard everything that I had given him about the science of what a spacecraft needs. And this is one of my favorite stories. This little girl's name is Rosaya. She heard me in a presentation say that 12 men had walked on the moon, but no ladies. So the next day, she comes to the camp and she hands me this piece of paper that says, Astronaut World at the top. And it says, finally, the Earth sent a mission to Mars. And the first person to exit was a girl named Rosaya. And she took the first bold steps on the red planet. And it took me a moment and I teared up because I thought, oh my gosh, she had a moment of engagement. She had a moment of wonder. She used her creativity and she had envisioned herself in the future. She was walking on Mars. That is the power of giving them this planet and this mission. At Human to Mars uh, and with Explore Mars, Chris is uh, very generous in allowing me to come in and do wild things with uh, the scouts in Washington, D.C. So this year, we had them think about what their settlement would look like. And uh, those folks down there in the bottom uh, went all out. They were going to melt uh, the water from the polar ice caps. They were going to traverse underground between habitats and tunnels. Uh, one kid was going to make sure that his rover had a self-cleaning garage. And I was like, I'll take one of those now. And uh, then we also had them design what the flag for Mars would be like. And we reminded them that if we go, it will be collaborative, that it won't just be, you know, necessarily us. We will go together as one, one. And if you'll notice, they're all in one, one in all. That's a pretty bold thing. And then one of my favorites was this right here. It just says humans. And you guys, when they talk about it, they talk about it very philosophically. They w wonder, can we travel back home? We don't know. If you have children there, we don't know yet if you're, the children you'd have on Mars can ever visit grandma and grandpa back on Earth. They wonder about the human factors. They wonder if when we go there and I ask them, do you think we'll be better? And they all agree that we will be better people. And I ask, why? Why do you think we'll be better? We argue, we grumble here on planet Earth. Why wouldn't we do that on Mars? And the darling kid said, there'll be too many hardships. We'll have to work together if we're going to survive. The gift, you guys, is, in, is right here to give to our future generation. And what you have to do is you have to, I think we have to make Mars experiential. Because once you create an experience with science, then the kid begins to care about it, and then there's relationship. And once you have a relationship, then there's inspiration, and you've got engagement. This little guy's name is Amadeus. I met him a month and a half ago uh, down in Houston. I was doing four days of hands-on activities, and uh, we, we served almost 7,000 kids that weekend. And he was one of the last ones on Sunday. If he had really made this amazing lunar lander out of paper plates, and he'd really considered shock absorption and how like, to like, kind of create a parachute fashion as it was falling to the ground. And at the end of the day, my phone had died, but I really wanted a picture of this engineering marvel. So I gave his mom my cell phone, and I said, would you please text me this? This is, this is too much genius for me to ignore. And so the next morning, uh, in the glamorous life of Janet's Planet, I'm leaving Houston at 2.30 a.m. to drive back to Nashville. And my 
my phone is blowing up with text messages. So I'm in the car and figuring, well, if, she, so if she's up, I'm up. So I called her and I said, thank you so much for the picture. She was like, well, my son's birthday is next week and I was wondering if you do birthday parties. And I was like, I'm headed back to Nashville and I'm sorry I can't. And so we talked in a few more minutes and I said, are you up and about to go to work? Um, and she's like, no, I have to go to the VA later today. I've got some health issues and sometimes a mom is just up early in the morning wondering how long I'll be around for my sons. And I was like, when did you say his birthday is again? So uh, it was the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. I said, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I tell you this. I promise that Amadeus will have a spacey birthday if Janet's planet has anything to do with it. And so on Tuesday before Thanksgiving, astronauts Hoop Gibson and Don Thomas called Amadeus to wish him a happy birthday. NASA engineer Dave Gabriel called him and wished him a happy birthday. Major General Carl Snyder, who is 88 and who Buzz, that's Buzz's friend, Buzz credits uh, Major General Carl for being the one person to encourage him to become an astronaut. Uh, Amadeus is holding uh, Major General Carl's book, Jet Pioneer, right there. Uh, Major General already sent that to him. And then Mary Ann Dyson, who also Buzz knows, who wrote co-wrote his Mission to Mars book. The thing that Amadeus told me on that Tuesday, he was like, well, I've, I've researched the Apollo missions and I've written two books and I'm really looking forward to getting published. I mean, he just turned nine. So Mary Ann wrote him a very long email about if you wanted to become a space science author, here's how to do it. Why would we do that? Why? Because it is our mission to encourage kids to stand in their inherent magnificence. And I will continue doing it until it is Granny's planet. Because that's what's going to matter, and that's going to be one of the kids who will get us to Mars. So, my question for you guys is, what will be your legacy? What will you be able to tell your kids and grandkids that your time on the hill, what did you accomplish? And how about you tell them, I gave you Mars. Very good, thank you, Jan. <laughs> All right, round of panel. Jeff Bingham will talk about uh, the policy history and the current policy of how we've been, frankly, it's not goal, Mars is not a new goal, so Jeff. <laughs> No, definitely not the most inspirational or exciting or that's kind of one. That long, that's my main I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, about the mandate for exploration that Chris talked about and uh, maybe a little bit beyond that and uh, why don't you go to the next shot? We can stop looking at that. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's another chart we can move to. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Please. <laughs> this is as much fun. I, uh, uh, oops. I got. I took this from my. It's really my my file, but I took borrowed it from from uh, Dittmar Associates. Anyway, you can go back to that. Uh, the bottom line, I guess, for me, in, in my part of this, is, is uh, at least for the foreseeable future, uh, what we're going to do with respect to going to beyond low Earth orbit is going to be a government-led program with government funding, taxpayers' money, uh, but with a lot of partners from a very broad cross-section of, of people and opportunities for other countries, uh, organizations, uh, industry, entrepreneurs. We're not going to do this alone. And, uh, you know, but the, it's guided, that will all be guided by a public policy process, which is a product of the interaction between, as you all know, between the Hill and the, and the White House, and uh, generally finds its, its, its uh, highest expression in the form of the law. And uh, that's when the, the law is a policy. And that's uh, most often, you know, when they can agree that uh, a given set of requirements is what we want to put in the law. And, Congress passes it and the, and the President signs it, ideally. We've had that experience. In many ways, I think people tend to forget the fact that starting in 2005, as a result of the 2004 announcement that we were going to go beyond low Earth orbit after the shuttle uh, was finished, uh, when President uh, George W. Bush came and made the announcement at NASA headquarters, uh, in 2005, the Congress said, okay, let's take a look at that, and we decided we would endorse that goal in the broad sense. But we had a few issues 
it took, it took issue with. We wanted to make sure that, that the station was still utilized and was available for independent research, research beyond <coughs> what they needed for exploration only because the vision said it would only be for exploration purposes. We said no, we want to have it for a broader range of science, so we created the National Lab designation of the U.S. segment and for that purpose. Was precisely to, to help show that the, the station was not NASA's alone and belonged to the country and it was available for a broad cross section of research. That was a 2005 act, so since 2005, <coughs> we've really been on a consistent path of establishing the groundwork policy wise to go beyond low Earth orbit. Not with specifics, that's yet to come, and I'll come on, I'll get to that in a minute. The 2008 bill was our transition bill. We knew there was an election in 2008. We knew we'd have a new administration regardless of the outcome. Uh, and so the Congress wanted to restate for the new administration that yes, we still believe in the exploration concept of going beyond low Earth orbit. We also still believe in the space station and the national lab. And we want you to be a little more specific with us about how to make that operate. And we believe we need to support a commercial development. We need to support the development of commercial crew, commercial cargo capabilities that would be an asset that NASA could purchase in the private sector. So we put that in the 2008 bill. In 2009, we got a report the, from the GAO that was required by the 2008 bill that said that NASA told them that when they finished the station uh, at assembly complete, their plan was to use the uh, station for research only until uh, 2015, and that they would only use about 47 percent. They only projected using about 47 percent of that total capacity. <coughs> so we said, okay, we'll take the other 50 percent, 50 percent, that's going to give you another three, we'll take 50 and make a uh, draw a line down the middle and let this uh, the remaining half be used entirely for non exploration related capability. Part of the reason for that was. And that's where the commercial entities are going to get their, their business case made in low Earth orbit, is by utilizing that station. And if it's exclusively for NASA's use, then that's not going to be possible. So that was the logic behind doing that in 2008. So the 10 Act came along, and that was really a reaction to the new administration's actual uh, plan to end exploration. <coughs> uh, it proposed the end of exploration when with the uh, incoming administration. We were going to put the uh, notion of, of exploration on hold for a five-year study period and then come back and revisit the idea after that five years. And in the meantime, we wanted to cancel all the programmatic efforts, Constellation, uh, to uh, uh, all we work, all we work the outcome of that study and then put a lot of money in technology, technology development to come up with new kinds of technology, which all of us want to see eventually. But the Congress said, no, we're not going to, we're not going to go that route yet. We're going to wait and, and uh, uh, we're going to go, go right ahead and, and keep moving towards uh, beyond, going beyond low Earth orbit. Uh, we decided we needed a heavy lift vehicle. Everybody told us that was necessary. And so we, we said, well, we needed to that. But, but uh, we, we, we agreed to go ahead and do a, an evolvable vehicle uh, okay. that would... <laughs> That would go to a from a 70 metric ton to 130 metric ton capability, and a multi-purpose crew vehicle, which became the Orion, which was already say as the, as the crew module for that uh, combination of capabilities. And we stopped there. We didn't go beyond that in terms of the requirements because we'd done that before back in 1990. Some of you remember the SCI, Space Exploration Initiative, that George H.W. Bush started and he announced in 1989 on the anniversary of, of uh, the, the lunar landing, made that speech you were there at the uh, uh, Air and Space Museum, and that we were going to go back to the moon and on Mars. And, uh, and the National Space Council at that time set up the synthesis group to uh, look at all the different ways that could be used to uh, to accomplish those objectives. And Tom Stafford was the, uh, the head of that synthesis group effort. And uh, we looked at everything. I was, I was a part of the staff for that. We looked at everything imaginable 
it, it really put me in mind of that exercise this week as we sat and looked through the different ar architectures. That's exactly what we did for nine months back in 1990 and 91. Unfortunately, we had the, the whole package, you know, all the way, to, uh, we had, had the, uh, the Earth liftoff capacity, the cis lunar, we had the lunar, we had the uh, you know, intro planet going out to Mars, transportation to Mars, we had the ground systems, we had all of it in each of these four architectures with variations on the theme. And then uh, somebody put out a price tag for that, it's $500 billion. So as we released the report, that price tag was put on $500 billion, and the Congress said, oh, sorry, that's more than we can handle. So it was dead on arrival, never even opened the opened the book, and uh, so we lost that opportunity. Um, but I think, and this is what I want to get to and wrap up with, I think we're coming close now to an opportunity that I think was presented by the most recent legislation that Congress passed, the transition uh, legislation, which established the requirement for a, a roadmap, once NASA to start getting very specific about you know, what will be the elements of that pathway from, from low Earth orbit to Mars, Moon, whatever, wherever, whatever mix makes the most sense. And so NASA is under the gun now. That actually, it was, it was due December first, right? Forty-five days. Okay. And so they'll get it to them. Huh? Forty-five days. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's hard. That's, that's not much time to do that job unless you've been doing a lot, a lot of work in advance of that, which I think they assume they can do it. But now, of course, we have a new administration, and I'm sure they want to see what kind of I's need to be dotted and T's need to be crossed before that, that finally was presented to the Hill. Even when that comes out, that's going to be a NASA view. That's the NASA consensus view of the way to go about it. There are other views about how to go about it. And those also deserve a hearing in some form. We've been three days looking at three other variations on that thing. And they also deserve to be looked, looked at. And what may make the most sense, uh, once the, the Congress obviously asked for this study and this report, because they wanted to be informed, you all want to get the information from NASA as to what they plan, so you can look at it and see what needs to be authorized, what's new, what do you need new authority to do? What, do you, what can you do by executive order? What can you do simply by program definition? You know, well, ultimately that's going to be the, the, the final test and the question is how do we turn that, the, uh, the, all of these ideas into a policy and then how do we make those, that policy into programs and reality. And, uh, and now that we have a new Space Council again, uh, this is just a thought, it might be that one way to achieve that new consensus is for this Space Council to establish something like the synthesis group, something not exactly the same, but something similar, that can then be the point at which all of these ideas come in together, whether it's a, these, these three architectures, whether it's a cycler or some portion there of that, some variation of that theme, all of these things come into the same mixing bowl of, of made with, uh, composed of the experts in the field, people who know how to do what needs to be done, and out of that, hopefully, would come a final kind of consensus of what the next real steps should be. <coughs> then we can sit down and talk about the legislation that any required to make that happen, what kind of a support activity needs to be ginned up among all the support groups to, to make that happen. And I think out of that, we will have, that's, that's the way the public policy is made. And as I said, as long as, as, long as this is a government-funded program to enact to the greatest extent, it's going to be a government, it could be a program guided by the law. That's the policy. And so that's, a, that, I throw that out as one possibility of a way to, to, to sort of put oil on the waters of everybody competing with their idea and this idea and that idea and bring them all together. I, mean, I think there are elements of all of those that make sense, but I'm, I'm not a technical expert. We need to get that in front of the kind of technical experts that can make those kind of decisions and come up with that kind of a bottom line that we can then really start, you know, showing them these kids not only are 
you know, look at that, that little red dot in the sky, but all the things are going to happen between now and that, now and that, that arrival. So, uh, but it's going to be guided by public policy, and, and uh, we have a legacy of public policy that's been putting us on this path and has been consistent since 2005. That's, that's something that is not often recognized by people who say NASA is a drift. NASA doesn't have a mission. We've had the mission, the long-term mission of, of going beyond low Earth orbit now for since 2005 in law, and then ratified by 2008 and 2010, and the 2017 Act in its 154 pages referred back to those prior bills 39 times. And basically said, yeah, we meant what we said. So we've got a consistent policy getting us to this point. But now, we, you know, the Congress intentionally did not go to the point of opening up and laying out the specific architectures. Now's the time for that kind of a process, maybe what I described, to happen to get us to where we can all be moving on the same sheet. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And before we go to questions, I just want to ask a couple of quick questions to a couple of the panelists. Uh, Joe, uh, what role the moon? Well, I mentioned earlier, uh, it's a great place for us to test out systems. And, uh, you know, we have a concept now that has been developed for um, a gateway out there. Um, the gateway uh, has a lot of potential uh, paths that it could, it could evolve into. Um, but the first and most important path that I see, and I was just going to remark back to Jeff, um, if we do that, I think that's a good idea to look at things again, but I would urge not to take a hiatus while we do that, because as I said earlier, by going out there and flying, we're going to learn a lot. And we've got, within a couple of years now, the ability to go fly out beyond LEO, and we ought to do it, because that information that we get from those early missions and in a lot of ways I see those missions as being like Gemini. I see those as our Gemini. We're going to go out there and we're going to test some things out and things won't work the way we thought and we'll have to make some changes to designs but I don't think we'll step a foot wrong by doing that while we're thinking about the rest of the well, I would agree with that. Yeah, and last question from me, um, Ellen. Often when we're talking to members of Congress, it almost seems like now that we've seen, there seems to be a lot of agreement that we're sending humans to Mars, a lot of people don't think yeah, we need to continue with robotic missions if we're sending humans to Mars. How can we best articulate the importance of the 2020 uh, precursor robotic missions to Mars? Well, I think it, it falls into a couple categories. I, I think there's still science that we can do robotically in preparation for humans to go, but um, NASA has spent a huge amount of time working on what are called the strategic knowledge gaps. What are the areas of Mars science that we really need to answer? For example, there are still issues with the properties of the Martian dust. Uh, we still want need to work on uh, things like understanding how to do ISRU at Mars. It's going to be really hard to get up off the surface. Uh, um, by taking all the fuel with us, we'd really like to manufacture that on the surface of Mars. What can we do in advance of sending humans? So uh, I think there's a combination of scientific questions that we can continue to make progress on as well with ro robotically, as well as answering these specific science questions that actually play in the, sen the safety of sending humans uh, to Mars. We could get into the issue that Martian dust has perchlorates in it, which are harmful to humans. Yeah, there's issues. Mars is not a friendly place. And so there's still science we need to do to make sure that when we get humans there, uh, they're going to stay safe. It's, it's, we can do it, but we need to answer a few questions. All right. Thank you. Uh, questions from the audience? Um, okay. Uh, thank you for the fantastic uh, presentation. So, uh, Ms. Stoke, my question is mostly directly at you, but anyone. Planetary production uh, guidelines, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a, a big issue, especially in the commercial industry right now, people talking about sending things to Mars or the Moon, they have to adhere to pretty strict planetary production guidelines, but we keep talking about landing humans at these very valuable locations with water, potential life. What do you think NASA should do? How should NASA approach the issue of biological contamination of these scientific areas? Well, remember, planetary protection is, is governed by an international treaty, and, and so it, it's not just NASA making the decision, it has to be made in the broader context of what the international scientific community thinks is the right thing to do. 
Now, obviously, just like with any issue, I, I think you've got people on all, all ends of the spectrum, people who think, why should we pay any attention to planetary protection, all the way to people who say we should never uh, send humans to Mars because we contaminate it. Um, and so obviously what, what the agency needs to do with, with a strong reminder that NASA is not a regulatory agency. Um, NASA provides the science to whoever then has to make those sorts of decisions, is that we say, let's gather the best science that we can. Um, I think that is actually a driver for bringing Mars back. I think it's a driver actually for eventually the, the first mission potentially having humans in Mars orbit teleoperating rovers that go into these special regions where we think there could be water close to the surface, there could still be what we call extant Mars life or living Mars life. Um, so I think there's things you can do scientifically to get ready uh, for humans going in terms of that forward contamination um, of, of Mars. Um, a, a friend of mine who's a former astronaut would say, you know, everything here on uh, the Earth is the most dangerous planet for humans. Okay. Um, everything here evolved with us and it's like ready and willing to, to do harm to us. Uh, I personally think that Mars bacteria would be like, what the heck is this? Um, so, uh, I, you know, but that's, it's not my field. And so I think we need to always make sure do we have the right experts? Are they looking at planetary protection from a practical point of view in terms of saying, let's get the science, the best science we can before we send humans. Let's make sure it's safe to send humans. Let's certainly make sure the backward contamination issue is, is well understood. Um, and I would, I, I would say all of this does point to, you know, to that 2003 Academy study that said, you know, it's probably best we bring a sample back from Mars before we send humans. So it, it does kind of come back to that, which again, I would urge we, we look at that issue given, given that the science has evolved in the last decade. Uh, Okay, Go ahead, Yeah, three parts. Did Gene, did Gene Cernan reject the idea of going to the moon? Did he pass a law that says we can't go beyond the white? Did he say we have to have a new law to go beyond that? No, I didn't, I didn't say that. We already, have, we already have the authority to go to the moon. Is there, there an oversight to what Congress mandates, and what's the difference between a law and a mandated law? Terminology, really. I mean, the law is the, law is the ultimate Don't change that of the law. Yeah, well, the, the law it incorporates the mandate within the law. I mean, the law is what generally people have refer to when they say, what does the law say? The law provides a mandate, so they, they, they work they work together, one's a little more stringent than the other. It doesn't disturb you that the major influence is on the Congress and the Congress is, is not pure. The Congress is not pure? I'm not reading the papers, I'm reading these days. No, I mean, the, the beauty of, if I'm taking your meaning right, the beauty of Congress is that, that when it works, it is representative of the people. I mean, that's, that's sort of the idea of the founding fathers, you know, that, that, that we get the input from the public to the representation of their members. So, you know, that's obviously in a, in a perfect world, you know, not, that we don't experience every day. But, um, you know, I spent 30 years doing this stuff, and, and more often than not, you know, I saw the constituents voice being heard and being reflected in the, the members' votes and their active action. Yes, yeah, you're back. I'll have a couple questions regarding the world mission architecture. It seems the biggest problems are the beginning and the beginning being Upward. where <laughs> what, what, is the, what is the status to operationalize nuclear thermal engines? And then at the end of the mission, um, where are we in terms of being able to upscale our Martian atmospheric entrance technologies to handle the large electric tonnage that's going to be required. Especially since a lot of sites that really are of interest are probably going to be the higher latitude ones and even, even extreme thinness of the atmosphere in there is slow down. Well, I, I think we have a ways to go with EDL technologies. And, and, you know, I will say that area to me is an area that needs more investment um, because we've been We've been focusing on 
what we have to focus on right now, which is getting SLS and Orion operational. We've been focusing on continuing uh, with the ISS and making sure we bring every bit of, of science and then hopefully getting getting ready for you know seeing some viable commercial activity in lower orbit. So you know NASA's had to had to keep its focus on that and and then now the plan is to say, all right, let's within the resources that NASA has, let's let's put the next emphasis of development onto the deep space gateway and the you know, which is obviously the prototype for the Mars transfer vehicle. Um, it, to me, you then say, all right, the next priority is clearly EBL technologies. But when you have limited resources, you say, all right, let's back in at least the plan we're on now with the deep space, space gateway can get us to Mars orbit around 2032, 2033. That was before I left NASA. That was sort of the plan that we were looking at. Getting to the surface is harder, so you say, how much, how much resources do I have? If I have more resources, we can bring that landing date of humans on the surface forward. If I have fewer resources, I have to push that date outward. If I bring more partners in, international partners, private partners, I move that date forward. So I look at the plan as kind of an accordion, where depending on partnering, depending on resources, you either move out or you move in. Now, obviously, from my perspective, I want to get to Mars, you know, soon. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm with Buzz. You know, we got to do this right way. And, and so, to me, I'd like to see that partnering and at least smart use of resources make sure that we can get to the surface. Because to me, that's where the scientific goal is: is getting humans to the surface. Now, to your your previous question, you know, I'm, I'm I've done I chaired some academy an academy study where we were looking at nuclear thermal propulsion. Obviously, we're not we're not there yet. And so uh, I think we should, we should be keeping that as an option, but I think we also need to be saying, all right, chemical propulsion is what we have now to get humans there. Let's keep pushing on other propulsion systems to get humans there faster, but let's continue to look at mitigating the effects. Let's con continue to look at radiation protection. Um, but at least from the research that's been done to date, with chemical propulsion, and a little bit of work, we can get humans there safely. I'm actually more worried about making sure we get the life support systems to be sustainable than I am the propulsion, which is work we'll do with the Deep Space Gateway, which is why the Deep Space Gateway is so important. Maybe I can just add just a little bit to that, too. Um, in terms of the nuclear thermal work, there is some work going on right now with low enriched uranium uh, fuel for the reactors. And in the next four or five years or us, I think, we're, we're going to have data that will inform a decision about whether to go to a full-scale development type activity with that. So it's not, it's not like it's gone. It's not uh, something that we back burnered or anything like that. We're just doing some very fundamental things right now, and that will that'll be there in time to provide the data to be ready for those 2030s type missions. And then the other thing on EDL that I actually was kind of surprised about was um, we don't have to go to Mars to test it. Um, so some of the new concepts, you know, one of the best places to test that is above 100,000 feet in the atmosphere here on Earth. Um, so both of those, we have opportunities to do some really good relevant work in the next few years here. Um, and then the last thing I was going to say is I mentioned the uh, sample return mission. A lot of us have been looking at a, a mid-20s um, heavy sample return type of mission where you, know, you, need a, you need a map, you need something to launch the samples back in orbit. Um, that could be a good EDL demonstrator that's sort of midway between where we are today with a one metric ton capability and where we need to be with about a 20 metric ton capability for humans. And so that, that is an also another robotic precursor that could address some of those issues. Too. Yeah, and for that reason, I really kind of, I know some people would like a quick and dirty sample return mission, mm -hmm. but to me it's such an opportunity to push those EDL technologies and to get that land at NASA. And it never, I never saw one single refrain <coughs> against it in the readers. I did make the attempt to contact this guy who wrote the article and let him have a few of my thoughts. <laughs> And uh, he uh, left a lot of blanks in his return to me. Uh, but this is the kind of barrier that is facing, I think, what kind of work that we're trying to embark here. We need to have more, more push, more impulse, 
more dry in order to get this, this public, which is fractured. It's a public that's going in every direction but Mars or anywhere up that way. So uh, anything you can do to push these people somehow, more outreach, more education, I guess, uh, this would be accepted. Thank you very much for what you've been doing. And I think, I, I agree, we should do a better job at getting responses out there. I think a lot of the community don't feel compelled, they don't feel they're going to be published, or they don't feel they are the ones who should be doing it, but everybody in our community should be at least writing letters to the editor when things come out like that, blogging back, or uh, frankly, you know, from new voices, newspapers and blogs are always looking for new authors, so we should all be continually pushing the message, not just responding to um, articles like that. I think we all agree that was a pretty stupid article. Uh, that was but, the title of it, too. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I think just continually kind of presenting this viewpoint from different points of view and showing also it's not just a small group of people who this is benefiting, but highlighting the broad reach, what Janet was mentioning, what the the inspirational value, which, you know, you just do it. such an amazing job, but also the economic value, and just show that this is a doable thing, and we need to do more pushing of that to make sure our community really works on that. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I was just going to say, the head of Lockheed Martin actually wrote a rebuttal to it that was actually really nice. But to Chris's point, it's like, in, in my view, I was just down at Marshall Space Flight Center uh, a week ago Monday, and we also can elevate jobs like welding. When you know that a woman named Hap was the welder, and like after she finished in World War II, and she was in Mobile and was no longer welding you know, ships, she ended up working for Marshall. It took them three months to realize she was a female, and she ended up leading the team of welders at Marshall. And so for Saturn V, it's like she was you know, making sure all of those parts. So I think that when we talk about STEM, and you guys go back and talk to uh, the folks that you work with, it's important to go, it's like there are multiple entry points. If you want to be a welder, that's 60 to $90 an hour. It's a great field. And you could also potentially, you know, do new kind of those cold laser fusion, I don't understand at all, uh, kinds of welding things that are going on. But, there's, but it's a huge, all of these, you know, wonderful technologies that are out there. But it's like to make, to make even, even those jobs a part of STEM so that we don't, we don't make it so science technology that everybody's going to wear a lab coat or everybody's going to be a scientist. There are many, many ways uh, to find your path in STEM, and I think that's an important thing to remember as we leave today. It's going to require an enormous amount of talent across, whether it's VR or communications. I mean, space would be pretty boring if it's only scientists up there, only a musician or an artist somewhere up there. So. <coughs> I can't believe Jeff had a question. Yeah. Uh, at the first National Space Council meeting in October, the Vice President made it pretty clear that the vision that he was pushing involved sending humans not just to the vicinity of the moon, but to the lunar surface. And that's been I think, anathema to a lot of Mars exploration applicants and want to go to Mars as quickly as possible. Are you factoring that into these architecture studies or arguments why you would convince the Vice President not to land humans back on Mars, um, on the moon, on the way to Mars? I'll, I'll take one stab at it. Um, I think, Jeff, uh, I wouldn't say it's anathema to us. I, I think the one thing we want to make sure is to follow the guidelines that the National Academy set out in the Pathways Report, which is don't go down any dead ends. Um, so, you know, anything that we do there should have a feed forward component that takes us, you know, in the direction of Mars, uh, as Jeff pointed out, because it's the law. Um, and uh, so, what we're doing now with the designs that we have, and, and a recent uh, example of that is um, um, some more uh, looking at the gateway and where the gateway would be located. Um, it's now in an orbit that allows access to the surface and allows access to the polar regions. So you can envision that with partners, uh, surface exploration can be undertaken um, utilizing the gateway. And uh, I think that's, you know, that's an example of having an open architecture that does what we need to do to do those Gemini-type checkout missions, but also allows 
folks who are interested in surface exploration or science at the moon to, to take advantage of that as well. Okay, yes, advice. Oh, you look like you're raising your hand. Yeah. I, okay, go ahead. <laughs> it's more of a bodacious statement or two. <laughs> <laughs> I frankly see no need for a crew in lunar orbit, almost period, to support lunar landings. And I am doubtful if it is fully justified in Mars orbit unless it is focused on the moons of Mars which offer a reusable lunar lander. It's not the way to do it. They are more efficient. They are revolutionary. Anybody want to talk about this? I don't want to. <laughs> well, I'll, I would just say, and that's that's the kind of thing exactly that I think needs to be brought into the consideration as we look at the revival of the same I have. But, but the time is coming when that the, the policy process is ready for it. They haven't been ready for it before. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Rich, right? Okay, Rich, uh, Rich, uh, explore Mars social media PR. Uh, one for Janet and then one for Ellen, Joe, and Jeff. Um, the reason why, as a proponent of STEAM, that making sure that A is in, in STEM, that picture is a very good uh, example. I believe the artist is Pat Rawlings. And, uh, I'd like to keep in mind, just to kind of, again, be a proponent of Steve, that when we were doing early planetary science, uh, and just coming in zeros and ones, and being stitched together and then put on a globe by hand, and then artists would come in and take that digital data and then basically have creative licensing. That was before uh, imaging, you know, and optics were put on spacecraft, so, you know. Janet's, Janet's, you know, propension for permission to dream is, is all credit to artists that have come up and artists today, like, uh, you know, some of the ones we utilize for our, our Explore Mars stuff. Um, and then for uh, Joe, Alan, and Jeff, what do you say to, what do you say to critics of human exploration of Mars that say that there's no economic value in it? He's in Joe Allen Jeff, so I'm with you. I'll go for me first. Okay. Um, so, I think the reference was the same part. Yeah. Well, my undergrad is in music and theater from Belmont University in Nashville. So there is, as you might have noticed, there's a little bit of drama in me. So, uh, so no, that, uh, so for me, it's like that helps me communicate the science story. Uh, Steam to me is probably where I live. I like, sometimes it's like, I go wherever you go, do you know what I mean? If you want STEM, I will call it STEM and I'll add the A all day long and slide it on in there. But um, when I talked to Pat Rawlings a couple of years ago at a conference, he said that when he first started working for NASA and doing space artist work, he actually had imposter syndrome. He was scared half to death they would figure out that he didn't have a clue as to what he was doing until he realized that the engineers would bring him something, halfway describe it, he would draw it, then when he would take it back to them, the engineers had then employed what he had drawn. And he realized that that also was his gift. It's many times when I sit on panels like this with learned scientists with very, very amazing degrees, and here she was, chief scientist, and I'm like, look at this rock star female I'm sitting beside, that I realized a few years back, I get to communicate science in a way to children and young people that maybe hooks them in and catapults them into a life of science. And so this science community needs me as much as I need them to keep me inspired about what to tell them next. But for me, yes, 
the A is, I think it's super integral, and I think it makes us better rounded people when we add the arts into the science and technology equation. Because when you look at VR and some of these things, there's all an eloquence, even to the most amazing equation. There's a beautiful, beautiful artistic eloquence there. That's really okay. Good. Oh yeah, okay. So uh, <laughs> economic justification, uh, or that there is no economic justification. So this is an interesting question, and you know, it kind of gets back to something Jeff said, that um, I think the exploration part, the actual really pushing out uh, beyond Leo, um, that is a government-led activity, and it probably should be. Um, but what I kind of foresee, and I think a lot of us are starting to see this starting to happen, with companies like Made in Space and Nanorax, and you, know, you just look at a lot of the people who are starting to emerge, um, is that as we go out, there's this you know, burgeoning commercial group that wants to come and fill in behind. And so lots of stuff could be done you know, in that sphere. And as we go further out, I'm even thinking like cis lunar space becomes very commercial. Um, there are people that want to mine on the moon and, and resources can be gotten from there and, and transported around to different locations. They can help support going further out. So it is hard, I think, to make an ROI. You know, if I have to go to a board and, and, and do to get resources uh, in our company and justify in a five-year time frame why we're going to go to Mars, it's very difficult to say you know, there's a business case there. But as we go and do that, and that's why I say, you know, we really got to get out there, we really got to fly and learn some of these lessons, um, then that's going to also be available to these people who want to go out there and do business. And that's going to help firm down risks that they're going to have, the asteroid miners, the, the lunar people, and all of those guys. So that's kind of my answer. Yeah, I, I would argue when you when you try to do really hard things, not, not incremental, and, and I feel on some level that going back to the surface of the moon is a bit more incremental than trying to say, we're going to send humans to the surface of Mars. And when you when you put that out there as a goal, you're going to have people inventing new technologies, you're going to have them inventing new materials, we're going to look at all these problems in a totally different way. And all I would say also is go back and look at Apollo, where you had the Apollo effect on the increased number of PhDs. You inspired, I would say, a whole generation of STEM professionals out of Apollo. Um, and, and how do you even begin to quantify that, let alone all the technology spin-offs and reminding people that NASA publishes a book this thick every year on technology spin-offs. All that, um, not to mention the fact that we actually do spend all this money here on Earth. We don't actually launch money to space. <laughs> yeah, my, uh, my boss, first center I went for flew on the space shuttle and, and I used to tell people I didn't take a wallet with me. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to buy up there. <laughs> but I remember too back in uh, around 94 or 5 there was a Chase Chase Econometrics I think was the name of the outfit that did a, a study to try to put a number to what the investment in NASA and they use the term investment as opposed to expenditure and the nuance there that I think is important. Uh, and what that returned to the economy you know, based on new industries, new variations on the industries, new products, new science. Uh, and they came up with a, a figure of like nine to one. For every one dollar invested in NASA, nine dollars came back into the economy. Well, that immediately, of course, came under criticism by everybody else who was not a part of Chase of Econometrics. And they had their own set of assumptions and they boiled it down. You know, it's only seven only six, or how can you be sure as any of those? And I said, for me, it came down to, look, if it's just one dollar back for every dollar invested, show me another government program to do that. So to, to the people in the Congress have to worry about making sense with the money, you know, the case can be made and almost on the face of it, it's obvious that there's, there's more that comes from this investment. And it is an investment more than an expenditure. And therefore, that's to me why we need to spend more time with members of Congress and staff looking around the budget for that extra stray billion dollars or two or three here and there that may be better used as an investment in NASA and NASA programs and then get a, and at least get a pocket of that back, you know, for, for dollars spent. 
I think we have time for about two more questions. So I believe you had a question. Yes, uh, my name is Andrew Pettis. I study science policy and write editorials at Georgetown. Um, you kind of touched on it from a financial standpoint, but I, I do seem to notice that the that's our space and space exploration, exploration has a PR issue. Uh, and one of the biggest things I've noticed is that it seems distant to a lot of people from different backgrounds. Uh, I was curious, maybe speaking to younger people and speaking to professionals too, how do you make it relevant to them in their education and relevant to people in their jobs and workforce and things like that? For me, it's like um, kids are ready to go. I mean, kids love outer space. Um, even as I was leaving my Airbnb, my host texted me and said, my eight-year-old son loves space, so I'm making sure I'm leaving him, you know, Janet's Planet swag on the table. I'm going to get everybody I can to be a STEM person somehow. But um, I think it's just, it's conversation, and it's doing what Carl Sagan did very well. It's making it accessible. Uh, here, here's the best thing that I can tell you. During the Great American Eclipse, I was the eclipse expert for uh, the local ABC affiliate there in Nashville. And I knew that we were on to something when one day I'm stopping to get gas at Circle K and this lady comes out and says, hey, I've seen you on TV. I got some questions about the eclipse. And I'm like, all right. So I went inside and I'm literally, there are 12 people gathered in a Circle K and they're asking me now, tell me again about Bailey's Beats. And, and is this really going to live up to the hype? All of a sudden, I was having a science conversation in a Circle K. That's what we've got to do. We've got to tell the story often enough. But if you'll notice, it's like NASA has just come out with this amazing tire that is impervious to a flat. It's made out of kind of like, it almost looks like knight's armor. It's mesh. I mean, I'm not sure uh, my friends at Goodyear or you know, Bridgestone there in Nashville will love that idea. But it's like, that's what's going to get them. Curiosity's tires are, are treading, right? It's like, that's what's just kind of falling apart there. But they just invented a tire. So what that's going to do for the economy. But it will be a blip on the screen on any news outlet. And so for me, it's like I have a great passion to like, like clone Bill Nye and Neil deGrasse and, and let there be more folks who are out there going, hey, did you know? Because I truly believe the public is hungry for it. It's long as we don't sound um, as long as we don't make it above where they are, that if we give it to them in a, in a way that it's like, oh, that's super cool. Because after I had people who said, I enjoyed the eclipse more because I understood what was happening. I think that's what we all have to do as a group is say, you know what, let's make it a conversation that happens more and more often. Yeah, the other event that I, I thought was really interesting in the last several years was the Scott Kelly's flight. Mm -hmm. um, be, because to me, um, NASA, you know, there's a certain amount of the public that follows space news and they like it, and I mainly refer to them as the nerd public I am one, so I can say that. Um, but to me, Scott Kelly's flight made it into the mainstream, and so part of that, I think, um, was, you know, the twin factor, but it was new, it was different, it spoke to a higher thing, going to Mars, humans to Mars, it was exciting, it was different. So I think we really need to think about that and why that made it into the general public news and kind of into people's consciousness, like the eclipse. What is it that, that these things, these science space things that break into the general public, what are their characteristics and how can we think about that as we lay out this 10 to 15 year program of getting humans to Mars? How can we think about ways to bring the public along with us as we go? And I think it's I think it's what she's talking about. There's a human there. We want there's a human and things are happening to his body. I think when we relate it to something completely relational and that very, very human, that if we go to Mars, we solve cancer, we figure out how for the astronauts there, for radiation not to be as much of a problem, then going to Mars becomes infinitely more interesting to a lot of people who have somebody doing that. So I think we have to create, we have to create the human story as we go to Mars. We have time for one more quick question. Anybody have a quick question? <laughs> I think to continue with uh, what you just said, uh, Janet, uh, it's also to expand um, the business of space or the business of Mars and invite more and more other type of fields. Because like for what I'm trying to do with Mars City Design, 
is to involve everyone else who actually mostly say, you know, I have no time for Mars because there is so much problems on Earth. But what we are trying to uh, say is that if you can actually solve Mars, then you can solve everything else on Earth. And if that is really true, then how can organizations like us who have no background in the space industry but know about business and what touch people every day, how can we get the support uh, from the space industries, for example, uh, because, for example, I went to your workshop, there is just a huge gap that I don't even know how to build this bridge between the people I know that are super interested in knowing about Mars and the real mission that have so much uh, thinking and, uh, you know, work behind. So this gap is the place where we have to basically build connections. Uh, I, maybe just one quick one there. I, I think what Chris did this time with the VR and AR uh, concept is a good example of trying to do that. And we've done it a couple of other times before, trying to bring together um, communities that don't naturally talk to one another, and then you find where the intersections are. And then you can go there. All right, well, very, very well. So thank you very much. So thank you to our panelists, Jeff, Janet, Ellen, Joe. I think you did a fantastic job, very inspiring. And I you know, are hoping that we'll be able to continue the momentum towards Mars so we can get there by the mid to early, uh, early to mid-30s. And so, as I mentioned earlier, we hope to be able to release our uh, fifth uh, Fording Mars or Achieving Mars report, hopefully by the end of January, certainly in February, which will have the analysis of the mission architectures that Joe mentioned. Um, and I hope you can also come to our Humans to Mars Summit, which will be here in D.C. once again and at GW on May 8th through 10th. It's going to be the biggest one yet. Lots of VR and AR as well as STEAM. And, and a lot of exciting things this year, so, or next year rather. So, hope to see you there. Thank you very much. <laughs>